Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Leggett. I'm the uh, former Denina Cultural Historian at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. And I'm currently the Senior Curator of Alaska History and Indigenous Cultures at the Anchorage Museum. I'm also the president of the Native Village of Aklutna. And today I'll be talking about past and present efforts about Denina language revitalization that I've been involved with for going on more than 15 years. First, uh, who are the Denina? Well, the Denina are part of the Na Dene language family here in Alaska. Uh, the Na Dene family includes Tlingit, Eyak, and the 11 Athabascan languages. There is actually over 40 Athabascan languages spread throughout Western Canada, and also uh, in the Southwestern part of the United States, for example, the Navajo and the Apache are also Dene speaking people. But today we'll be talking specifically about my people, the Denina. We are the um, Athabascan speaking people or Dene speaking people in South Central Alaska. I come from the native village of Aklutna, which is the only federally recognized tribe here in uh, the municipality of Anchorage. And today about half the entire state's population lives within our traditional homeland, which is about 41,000 square miles or about the size of Ohio. The Denina language is broken up into four mutually intelligible dialects. Um, my people are part of the Upper Inlet Denina. The Outer Inlet Denina are the people along the Kenai Peninsula and the western half of Cook Inlet. The Iliamna Denina are the Denina living around Iliamna Lake. And the Inland Denina are the most rural uh, of the Denina speakers, and they live primarily in Nondalton and Lime Village. Denina, like every, uh, almost, like almost every indigenous language, wasn't a written language and didn't have an official orthography until the early 1970s. Um, from 1975 to about 1990, there was a steady output of Denina language material after this orthography had been established by the Alaska Native Language Center. So uh, this picture here, uh, this shows four of the five uh, Denina uh, language writers of the 1970s, starting from the left, you have Michael Krauss, who started the Alaska Native Language Center and first developed the orthography. Uh, Joan Tenenbaum was a PhD uh, linguist uh, in the 1970s that did a lot to refine uh, Denina orthography and spent most of her time in uh, non-Dalton. Next to her is Jim Carey, uh, who has been the most active uh, writer of Denina as far as documenting and uh, capturing, uh, working with almost all the fluent speakers of the late 20th century. On the right, uh, next to Jim is the late Peter Kalifornsky, uh, Denina from Kenai, who learned um, uh, when he was in his, I believe, about his late 60s, how to learn the language. The only person missing that was also a Denina writer was the late Albert Wasley. We'll see a picture in a minute. So starting in the 1970s, uh, there was a lot of effort. Uh, there were still uh, a good number of Denina language, uh, first language speakers. And so there were workshops to capture um, traditional stories, songs, work out things like verb paradigms, uh, really kind of completely document the language. Here's a picture of the late uh, Albert Wassily, taken also around that time. Here's a picture of Peter Kalifornsky in the late 1980s. Um, Peter was unique in that he uh, preferred to write out stories um, and work on them and refine them as opposed to record them and then transcribe them. So he would spend sometimes months uh, working the stories out, working them out, to, to present them just the way uh, he wanted them to be captured. These are uh, some of the books that were produced um, from, the, like I said, the late 70s through uh, the late 1980s. Joan Tenenbaum's book, Denina Sukdua, uh, from her work in Non Dalton. Peter Kalifornsky's Katlagi Sukdu, A Denina Legacy. Uh, Tabona Esnena, The Taonic People's Country uh, from uh, over across the inlet, 
and Albert Wassily's uh, Denina Kanaga Duch Doldich, uh, the Denina Athabaskan Junior Dictionary. However, by the early 1990s, with the death of Shem Pete in 1989, Albert Wassily in 1989, Anton Yvonne in 1983, Catherine Nikolai, most of the Denina language work, with few exceptions, um, had ceased. So when I grew up um, in Anchorage, um, I was born in 1981. Um, there wasn't really much activity going on uh, with the Denina language, and it looked um, like it was going to cease. However, by the early 2000s, the new generation of Denina who had read these books, if they could find them, it should be pointed out that most of these books um, had long gone out of print and were uh, hard to find. You'd only find them at uh, specialized secondhand bookstores or Sometimes you know you would get them from your relatives that had held on to them for all the years, um, but the people started realizing that the last generation of fluent speakers um, were going to pass away um, soon if if something wasn't done to save our language from extinction. This is. Um, a Denina Language Institute, the first one that I attended, I believe in 2003, held at the Denina, or excuse me, at the Kenai Peninsula College. It was a three week intensive working with um, most of the, the strongest Denina speakers uh, that were still left at that time, uh, trying to uh, capture information and try to get a new generation of, of people interested in the language. One of the things that <clears throat> had been talked about quite a bit by the elders was that they knew that there were all these recordings that existed, but that we had no access to them. The late Jim Wilson, who I first met in around the year 2001 uh, at the Alaska Native Heritage Center said it best when he said, you know, all these recordings, if we don't get it out and learn about it, where are we gonna learn from? These are old recordings, we wanna give it out and teach our younger children what the elder people are talking about. I think that's a very good idea for getting it free so we can listen to them. So from 2003 uh, up through uh, 2011, these are some of the Denina language grants that existed. Uh, 2003 to 2006, there was the Denina Language Institute through a US Department of Education Title VII grant. 2003 to 2005, there was the Denina Archiving Training and Access Project and the Alaska Summer Research Challenge and the Northern Indigenous Languages Archive. 2004 and 2007, the Kanites Indian Tribe had uh, an ANA grant. 2005 to 2008, the Alaska Native Heritage Center re received a Department of Education grant to teach Denina after school and in one middle school. 2008 and 2009, there was a US Forest Service grant um, as part of um, remediation down along the Russian River. Uh, 2008 to 2010, there was another Alaska uh, uh, ANA grant for language preservation at the Heritage Center. In 2009, 2010, there was KNBA's Denial of Lifeways. And 2008 to 2011, the National Science Foundation's Documenting Endangered Languages grant. One of the uh, outcomes uh, from this, speaking to that exact thing, was the development of a website called Kanaga.org. Kanaga means language in the Denina language. And um, as far as I know, this was the first comprehensive online um, database that provided access to uh, uh, language materials and audio recordings uh, in the state of Alaska. So you could browse the recordings, look at documents, um, and search other records. These are just some examples, uh, some of the documents that had been put in there. It was an active uh, database. So things that were being produced uh, during those years were uploaded um, you know, as, they, as they became uh, available. This is just some examples of some of the recordings. So using Kanaga.org and this new access to uh, these recordings, I worked uh, as the host and producer of a series of 26 Denina language clips 
that aired on Quantic uh, Broadcast Corporation KNBA Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. In addition, there's a website that housed all the clips as well as audio transcripts, Google Maps of the location and photos associated with each story. This is how the website looked um, in the around 2010. Uh, sadly, with updates to technology and no active funding, uh, this is no longer uh, as robust as it once was. So this is just another example of some of the stories that were there. There's the transcripts and the locations. So starting in 2007 uh, through uh, 2013, I was also co-curator on an exhibition called Deninak Kuchil Yashi, The Denine of Way of Living. Uh, this involved uh, working with a Denine advisory committee along with uh, uh, elders, scholars, researchers, museum professionals, uh, where we tried to, to document all known Denine objects and museum collections and created a, a, a large exhibition uh, at the museum. One of the films that was produced for, um, for the exhibit, and probably if you talk to most people who saw the exhibition, the highlight of it, although at the time we didn't know this, was the Denina Dining film. Um, we got a group of Denina elders together and we filmed in real time uh, a Denina meal with traditional foods uh, the Denina names for every, um, you know, uh, food product, and um, it was really kind of a natural conversation of using language, both in English and Denina, um, and uh, people seem to respond quite well to this. Uh, these are all uh, online on the Anchorage Museum, so you can still uh, access them to this day. Uh, some of the objects that were featured in the exhibition, it was also important uh, for the advisory committee that language take a, a, a prominent role in the exhibition. And I'm proud to say that every object in the exhibition uh, used the Denina name for the object and when possible um, highlighted some of the regional differences in dialects. And so if we knew where the object was collected from, we tried to use the word as it was said in that, that place or village. Also, again, using those recordings uh, from the Alaska Native Language Archives, uh, we did a series of uh, storytelling short stories um, where visitors could sit down um, on an iPad, listen to Denina stories in both English and Denina, see the Denina translations uh, and transcriptions, and uh, get a sense of what it would be like to sit in the Nichith, the traditional winter home, and listen to uh, these stories. Again, this is also on the website. This is an example of one of the stories, Nelt Chish uh, Chukdu, the Wolverine story. Again, you could hear it in Denina or in English with trans full translations. Um, there were touch interactives. You could feel things like uh, Kunsha, yes, or uh, ground squirrel skin. Uh, other interactives like this quiver, uh, that you see to the right and the Denina names for the animals that are depicted on the quiver. Another fun interactive using language was uh, the moose interactive. We repurposed a moose from our Alaska gallery and provided uh, various names for the different parts uh, of the animal. So the Denina name for moose is Kochtai. One of the names is Kochtai, and then moose knows Kochtai ben Chich. Uh, his antlers, Kochtai Vida his neck, Kochtai Kus, and um, the moose shoulder hump, Kochtai uh, Beying Lala, Beying Lala, Kochtai Van Ying Lala. There we go. Also, um, inspired by the work of the Denina Language Institute, working with the Smithsonian's Arctic Studies Center, uh, we created. Um, a series of short language films uh, highlighting uh, Athabascan or Diné objects that are on display in our Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center. And we also produced um, a 280 page uh, catalog that has over 600 images and all 
uh, the photographs, we had all the objects photographed and uh, languages used throughout uh, the book quite extensively. So um, around, I wanna say about 2013, 2014, uh, I think largely based on the previous work done on Kanaga.org, the Alaska Native Language Center um, imported all the data that had been on Kanaga.org and um, used it as a template for all the Alaska Native languages around our state. And so if you go on the Alaska Native Language Archive, now you can select the language and you can, um, much like you could on Kanaga.org, click on them, see uh, text or audio or both, and uh, look up you know, these materials that previously had been kind of locked away in Fairbanks. Also part of uh, language revitalization was uh, the use of language throughout uh, the community. A lot of the work that I do is outside of the Anchorage Museum's walls. In 2015, we decided in 30 foot letters um, to put up the Denina phrase, Chinan Guninu, which means thank you, you came here, uh, putting kind of a declarative statement on the front of our museum. Um, this was well received and we've continued to do various efforts around Anchorage uh, to get more indigenous uh, place name and land acknowledgements and recognition. During uh, the pandemic, uh, in those early years, so we're coming up almost, it's hard to believe, but two years ago, uh, in those early years, uh, we knew that at the museum, with the museum being closed down, that we're gonna have to shift to providing content um, online and in a lot of different uh, formats. So one of the ideas that I came up with was a denying a word of the week, where um, did a pronunciation for a place name or um, a plant or an animal, uh, and so um, I think we did about 20 of these uh, during those, the, that early part of uh, the pandemic. So this one, uh, again, on the museum's website, Nuchishtunt means place protected from the wind and it's point warns off here in Anchorage. Just a fun way to get out, you know, different denial of words. Uh, another project that was completed right before the pandemic, um, one of the ideas that I had for the Denina exhibit that we didn't uh, produce at the time, uh, but I thought would be a fun activity was to do a Denina ABC book. Um, and it's called Na uh, Kanarach. It means good words uh, to never forget. We worked with uh, local uh, artist, Ted Kim, to um, select uh, you know, every letter of the alphabet and depict the scene uh, representing that. And that's available in our shop or online through our Anchorage Museum shop. Um, so, you know, coming, I would say from about 2013 till about 2020, there was a bit of a slowdown in activities um, as far as actively, uh, you know, producing um, a Denina Language Institute or really a focus on language. Uh, Various people had moved on to different jobs. I was involved with a lot of different projects. But in the last couple of years, the Kanaitse Indian tribe has really stepped up uh, to kind of be the active base for teaching language. Uh, the Kanaitse Indian tribes work closely with the Kenai Peninsula College to offer um, college level Denina classes and is, is actively working to uh, kind of continue the work that it had slowed down uh, for a number of years. So if there's one thing I've learned um, over the last 20 years that I've been involved uh, with cultural stuff is that these things kind of come in phases and there's a period of intense activity and then things slow down and then things pick back up. And so right now I'd say we're in kind of a, a ramping up of, of trying to figure out how organizations like the Anchorage Museum, the Kanaitse Indian Tribe, the National Park Service, Lake Clark Division, uh, the Bristol Bay Education Foundation and the Alaska Native Heritage Center can work together to help support language work and that we're not uh, duplicating efforts because unfortunately, one of the things that we learned in that period of, of flurry of activity was that uh, there was a bit of overlap and uh, in basically recreating some efforts that had already been done without talking to each other. And so 
again, it's been hard because of the pandemic, but in some ways it's easier. Uh, we're having monthly Zoom meetings to kind of keep everybody uh, apprised of, of what's going on. Um, again, related to this um, and my work and place name recognition, this is down at Westchester Lagoon. This is a Denina interpretive site marker at Chanchnu. Chanchnu means grass creek. Um, we eventually want to put up about 30 of these throughout the, the Anchorage Bowl, connecting them up to the trail systems and uh, the various parks around Anchorage and um, you know, creating a cohesive effort, perhaps uh, a tour of Anchorage, uh, hopefully one day a, an app with audio uh, storytelling um, and things related to that. Uh, one of the exciting things was in November, uh, our efforts were um, uh, picked up by the Washington Post and we actually made the front page of the Washington Post uh, during um, Alaska Native American Indian Heritage Month uh, and talking about this. So it's exciting to me that, uh, you know, this isn't just getting attention here in Alaska, but that it's getting national attention and that we can in some ways be on the forefront of reclaiming indigenous languages and, and making people aware of, of you know, uh, native homelands. Uh, again, also related to that effort on the front of the Anchorage Museum, we've had up for a number of years. This is Denina Elsmena. That means this is the Denina homeland. Uh, it's a declarative statement by the museum and it's part of its decolonization uh, to recognize you know, where it sits and, and whose land. Um, this is, and I'm really fortunate to work at the museum and that they support the work that I do, not just at the museum, but throughout the community. And that's it.